Hi, this is the Everything Else Show. This is when I do shows of things that kind of fascinate me. And I heard about our guest tonight, uh, Nelson Dellis, uh, through Dave Scott. I was on his uh, uh, radio program out west and in, uh, in, in British Columbia. And so he connected us. And I'm uh, very honored to have an incredible human. He's been considered one of the superhumans. Here he is, Nelson Dellis. Hey. Hey, Martin, how you doing? Good, good. Thank you for being willing to come on. Yeah, of course. And, no, no problem. Well, uh, you know, the memory thing is really, I think, is fascinating. But you're also, you've done so many different things. Uh, what a background. And uh, when I said a superhuman, weren't you part of some uh, competition, like a superhuman competition or something? <laughs> one time? Yeah. yeah, there was a Fox show. Uh, I had like two seasons, I think, but it was called Superhumans. And they just collected a bunch of people who could do seemingly superhuman things. And uh, it was like a competition talent show kind of thing for money. I see. Yeah. And how, how did you do on that one in particular? I did not win. Uh, I right. was up against some tough competition. The, the person who won on my show was a, a young kid. I think he was like 14, 15 uh, calculator. So he could do insane calculations really fast. And he was a charming little kid, so uh, no hope. You know? Hard to compete. Yeah, yeah. I know those awesome. the the people that can. I mean, you can probably do pi for a while too. Even I don't know if you have that memorized, but I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do a lot. You do, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Figures. Thousands, thousands of digits. Is that right? That's amazing. That that's always just fascinating me. I love watching things like that. Um, how people have these abilities, and uh, I I remember um, there was. Uh, there was someone they called the Rain Man of York, a guy from York, Maine, and he was autistic, but I'm telling you, could he ever remember dates going all the way back to the Civil War? Oh, wow. And I confused a date that my son was born on because he was born on a, a 13th of, of the month. Okay. And you know how your mind can kind of group things? So I said, no, he was born on a Friday. He said, no, he wasn't. He was born on a Monday. And then he got really upset because I was challenging him and uh, he was absolutely right. But that's, that's always been fascinating to me, but we're here to talk about a little bit about the memory part, but also uh, remote viewing, which is as soon as I heard that you were getting involved in that, uh, that's, I had, uh, I don't know if you know who Edwin C, Edwin C. May from, of course. Uh, yes. yeah, of course. I had him on my show several years ago from uh was it stargate project right yeah in the yeah, 1970s yeah. yeah he's probably the the person who's, who's who's researched this the most um fascinating person to talk to so yeah cred so credible too which um yeah I've, I've talked to him a number a number of times and we've had great conversations he's a physicist so that's my background um and so when we talk together i feel like i'm talking to somebody that i know and trust and yeah. believe in so it just adds to the whole um my whole belief system you know yeah uh what was that there was a movie the men who stare at goats or something like that was that a, that was more or less about that yeah right? it was yeah exactly it's it's um i think it's a comedy it's it's not a great yeah. movie unfortunately george uh what's yeah george clooney's in it Clooney, yeah. um uh, spacey's <laughs> in it yeah, tons of people. Uh, Jeff Bridges, I think, and um, even McGregor. Uh, yeah. great cast, you know. But <laughs> I don't know. It's um, I, I do know that it's like an amalgamation, uh, an amalgamation of all kind of these sci uh, stories and legends. Some true, some not. Some kind of blurred together. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they took quite a few liberties with the truth. I think so. Oh, that's too bad. They had, they probably didn't even have to. It's probably spectacular enough, yeah. Without having to do that. So, what what made you look into remote viewing to begin with? So, yeah, it's 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 an interesting story. Um, I was reached out. Well, not personally, but there was a message board uh, for us memory athletes, the people who do these memory competitions, on Facebook, and it was. Um, uh, a message very vague saying, you know, here's a gig, basically get paid a little bit of money to learn some skill and to apply it. 
uh, part-time, whatever. That's it, right? I'm usually interested in these kinds of things because I've, I've had some very interesting job opportunities or one-off gigs, you know, because mm. of memory that have kind of seemingly nothing to do with memory and it's just a fun ride. So <laughs> I always throw my hat in the ring and see what happens, you know? Yeah. Um, so I did. I got a call maybe the next day and uh, it was from a very eclectic guy um, who straight from the bat, uh, off the bat was like, hey, have you heard of remote viewing? And I said, um, no. <laughs> what is that? Is, is, you know, it was during COVID time. So I was like, is that like, I, you know, you're watching TV remote with, from somewhere else? Like, I mean, that's what we do now. That's not a, that, yeah. part, you know. No, he's like, no, it's, uh, you ever heard of this government program where they use psychic spies? And I was like, I think I've heard of something like that. I don't know. But my eyes at that point were rolling in the back of my head. I was like, okay. <laughs> here, we, here we go right this is it's one of these it's, and i also felt like maybe there's some scam or they're gonna ask me for money or something like that they didn't um in fact they were gonna pay me uh to train me uh a memory athlete because supposedly in their little research group uh they had an idea where they wanted to test out the idea that people like me who have highly trained visual um, abilities through the memory thing um, would be better remote viewers Hmm. Um, so they wanted to test that out i was paired with a a remote viewing expert coach um, for a month we trained every day for an hour or two and um yeah i was paid a little bit and then the goal was after the month i was going to be doing these tasks for um this company which was basically a trading firm and they were trying to predict um you know stock uh, movement Oh, stop. With us, with me and, and the other remote viewers. Yeah. That's a dangerous game, I would think. Yeah. I mean, it's not my money. So, uh, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's how it started. So, I was very skeptical at first, but I thought two things I'll make a little bit of cash. I have the time and cool story, right? Weird, yeah. cool story that I can uh, maybe put at a footnote in, in a book someday or something. Yeah. So, uh, before I ask, uh, the next question, what it is and what it isn't. Um, I, I was on a uh, radio show. I was on audio only. And the guy said, oh, I do this to every guest, uh, remote viewing. So I have something on my desk. Tell me what it is. And I just said the first thing that popped in my mind. I said, something that looks like a turtle. And he said, well, it's a hard hat. So yeah, that's close enough. I mean, that's that was my only <laughs> experience. And it was just it's just whatever popped in my mind. I don't know why that did, but that's awesome. Yeah. But, I, mean, I mean, yeah. Some, and, and it's probably nothing to it, but let me ask you a couple things here. Do you think that it necessary, it doesn't necessarily, or it does necessarily take someone with a, a visual and good memory like you have, or do you think that about anyone could try it and do it? Yeah. So I, I wasn't convinced that, it made a difference. Um, I mean, I think from the statistics that I have from the trials I did for them, and I've done a ton of trials personally, um, I feel like I'm okay. I'm, I'm maybe not amazing. I'm, I think I'm maybe better than okay, maybe just good. Um, but I don't think it's, well, I don't know, frankly. And I think from their end, I don't think it was conclusive um, whether that was true or not. I think anybody can do this. Um, I do think it's kind of like, you know, maybe one's ability to learn languages, let's say, um, or music. You know, some people may have more of a gift, uh, you know, than it comes naturally to them, but everybody can play the piano. You know what I mean? Um, mm. We just can't all be Mozart. Um, so I think there's definitely people who are playing up here um, and don't have to try too hard. People like Joe McMonagall. Um, oh, yeah. I know that name and in, in, Ingo Swan. And Ingo and, Swan, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know Hal Putoff had something uh, in this, and I, I know there's some others, but I, I can't think of their names. There was one guy, oh, McGonagall, that's who I was thinking of. He did a lot of the training as well, didn't he? Yep, yep, he was part of that, and uh, we interviewed him for a project recently, and, man, just listening to him, you know, it's – the, the amount of detail and, and the proof and, and he's, he's one of the only, I, mean, I think the only remote viewer that has been 
so widely televised performing his ability. You know, if you mm-hmm. want to talk about um, debunking or proving or whatever, um, there's proof. Uh, gr- granted, these are TV shows, but a lot of these shows are, um, they basically had panels of judges that would try to debunk what he was doing. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding, what he's doing there. So Now, I've, I've had this weird thing going on um with my uh girlfriend and i we have these weird synchronicities i mean really Mm. really weird constantly i mean like last i'll give you an example this is just a a minor one compared to some of the ones that have happened but last night i was uh asking her where we saw justin hayward from the moody blues and what was the name of the theater and she said it was the monkey in plymouth new hampshire and just at that moment, I got an email and I've only gotten a couple for like at bands in town. That's what it's called. And but never of Justin Hayward. And it's Justin Hayward in the top. The first place he's playing is at that venue. And I got no that way. email at the same exact time. You know, and I'm uh, what I'm getting. I mean, that was just, that's just one thing. There's been so many things. But anyway, um, does synchronicities. Is that is there any part of that that uh, could play a role in 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 this type of situation? And what do you think yeah. about synchronicities anyway? Yeah, I think it. You know, if we're gonna try to get down to like why I think remote viewing works, I, the bottom line is I don't know. I maybe have some ideas and fantasies about what could be interesting if it was, but I think whatever it is, um, I think it permeates into a lot of the human experience more than we care to give it credit for. Um, I think there's a lot of um, unseen connections between all of us beings mm. with consciousness, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine, I like to think this, that perhaps people who are maybe more, more emotionally connected, like you and your girlfriend, a significant other, even twins, right. Maybe have this even more so, um, so yeah, things like that where you you're kind of on the same wave, wavelength, uh, you pick up on things uh, simultaneously, or you can kind of predict or read each other's minds. It feels like sometimes uh, I think is is probably more common than we think. Granted, you know if you're living with someone, you can probably you're probably picking up on cues that you're not aware of, right? Just you know maybe you sense things with you know, a second before you even realize it. Um, but I think there are also some of these instances where it's just like, you can't explain it. You just know it. And there's no other explanation. And I think that hmm. possibly lives in the realm of, of, of what is happening with remote viewing and um, these psi abilities. So like intuition and a type intuition. of way. Yeah. yeah. Whenever I talk about this, cause I always feel a bit shy to come forward and explain that I'm into this. It's, it's a big departure. Well, you're, in, you're in the right place. So. Uh, yeah, I feel very yeah. comfortable here. <laughs> but uh, from my background and everything that I've believed in my life, it's a big departure for me in recent years. So it's it's a bit challenging for me to step foot in there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and people will criticize, um, but I'm okay because I've experienced this and I feel like I've done enough in it and studied it enough that I'm not just throwing stuff out there. I, I feel like I've had an experience and, and I'm explaining my experience and that's, that's kind of it. Um, not saying for sure that it's, it's, it's real or uh, that there's something really paranormal going on, but um, my personal feeling is that there is. Um, so, yeah, but, it, but, w- but what I was going to say is that when people question this and they don't understand what the hell I'm talking about, I say, Hey, we all have this feeling of uh, having a gut feeling, right? Yeah. I think everybody can relate to that where, you know, something's wrong. You just feel it or you maybe feel somebody's following you or, or staring at you. Um, this intuition, right? I shouldn't do this decision or, or, or I should go somewhere else right right now. We all have that, uh, can relate to that. And I think that's kind of the starting point of what this really is about um, is that we're able to pick up on information that isn't really perceivable, but we just feel like we know it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've had things where I'm just absolutely certain about something and, you know, I mean, but it, uh, some of it could be coincidence, but, um, right. You know, there's, so 
Um, I, you know, someone's asking for you to please share your experiences. I'll get to that. And, uh, but um, can you please explain what remote viewing is and is not just so it's clear to the people, you know, watching and will be listening. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Um, so at its base, it's, it's, it's basically ESP. All right. So some extra sensory perception um, specifically remote viewing. I define it as the kind of controlled protocol uh, that one does to um, try to perceive things that are not um, local, uh, meaning nearby or perceivable by our normal five senses. Okay. Um, So what that might mean is I could potentially perceive something in a bunker in Siberia, right? Um, mm-hmm. Or see something on the moon, right? Uh, and it's it's also local, a remote meaning now, the future, the past, potentially even. So it's not limited to time and space, you know. And then in terms of viewing, the remote viewing part, you know, it implies that you're you're seeing, right? But I think a better term to to go by is perceiving, right? So. Hmm. Not necessarily seeing with your eyeballs, but just kind of like feeling and sensing um, data. And also what it's not is, is well, this may vary, maybe for the, the best remote viewers, it's, it's quite different. But um, ultimately, it's not, um, you know, it's not in high fidelity what you're perceiving. You can imagine that maybe you have like a film, like a, a sheet, a black sheet, right, with little holes in it. Right. And what you can see is if you were to look through this tiny little pinhole, um, you know, and sometimes you maybe get a slightly bigger pinhole or a few different pinholes and you can kind of get more of the picture. But it's not like I'm looking at something. Um, Maybe people who are better at this can see more. But usually the data that we get um, is quite weak um, and not super clear, um, but it is still something. And I think that counts for a lot because it's coming from somewhere that uh, isn't um, possible through the normal senses. Yeah. Speaking of normal senses, you know, I I say this on the show that I do about UFOs a lot, that we probably know very little of what's actually going around us on around us all the time with the senses that we have, the spectrum and all of our other senses, maybe electronic sensors can pick up things like that. But I've also heard people talk about everything's on a vibration and everything is like connected, you know, I mean, uh, you know, which is, is another fascinating uh, realm of kind of along the lines of possibly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard, you know, people explain potentially what's going on there too. And, and it, it can, I think it kind of vibes with what I'm saying as well. So, um, so, uh, I guess, you know, for, there's a lot of people asking, they're, tr- they're trying to get <laughs> to answer uh, what uh, color is their shirt and what they had for dinner <laughs> and stuff like that. So right. what is, uh, I mean, let's, let's just say you're about ready to do a session. I'm not mm, saying you yeah. are, but just say, how, how does one set it? How's it set up and how, how's all that work? Yeah, that's a great, uh, for those asking that question, that's exactly what I was doing too with my remote viewing coach the first day. I was like, all right, here we go. What am I about to say? What did I do <laughs> you know, this morning? What am I going to do tonight? You know, um, And it, it, I was surprised to learn that it wasn't quite that. Uh, maybe a little bit di- disappointed even too because I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to learn how to be a psychic and I can just tell the future, right? But again, I think it's helpful to think like there's – you're looking through a pinhole here. Um, and so it's, you can imagine how blurry and how you can't see very wide, right? So it's very uh, limited in what you can do. Um, so knowing that, um, and Ed May will say this too, that it's not the best way to get information. Um, there are probably better ways, you know, especially now with satellites and all that stuff. But um, if you want to talk about the cheapest, um, well, and if, if you can actually look across time too, then that is something we can't do otherwise. But um, for what it what it costs to do that, it's, it's actually pretty um, 
cost effective because you just need your mind and a piece of paper and a pen, right? Anyways, so when, when I sit down to do a session, what's really important is, um, and again, I don't know why, I don't have any explanation for this, but it works best when it's blind. What you're doing is completely blind, right? So if somebody were asked me like, what color shirt am I wearing? Um, I already know I'm trying to guess a color, right? And I probably don't know the person, but you know, if I even look at their name, their username, or I can see where they're from, I'm suddenly gonna have things that are gonna bias potentially what I guess, okay? Um, so, and Joe McMonagle is very adamant about, you know, whenever you do a session, it has to be double blind. Um, double blind be meaning the person doing the task has no idea what is the thing you're trying to see. Um, and even the person who's assigning the task doesn't know. Okay. So That's how does that, how, I'm trying to figure out how that works. So like someone is handed something and then they hand it to someone else and Basically, yeah. I see. And, yeah, and so what I get as, as, as the remote viewer, I essentially get a six to eight digit number, totally random. Um, and that number is associated. Um, so someone design, uh, sets up this target where the, the, the number actually represents some thing. And that thing could be, you know, I'm just trying to guess what a picture is, let's say. Um, or, you know, I don't know, in the government, whatever they were trying to spy on, you know, what's at these coordinates, right? Something like that. Um, but as the, as the viewer, um, I, don't, I don't know anything. The, the less I know, the better this works, okay? Huh. Um, That's because the whole Yeah, because the whole yeah. thing is based on what we talked about before, intuition um, and kind of this um, the, the kind of subconscious, unconscious mind, all right? Um, any time, and our minds are always trying to make logical sense of the things we don't understand. So as soon as I have information, my, my, you know, logical mind is trying to make reason out of it. And that's what we have to block out. That's really what this whole skill is about is quieting that analytical mind because it's going to try to make sense out of what seems like just noise. Right. But the, the actual process is about honing and, and nurturing that intuitive um, streamlined inf set of information coming through. So I'll have this task number. I'll sit down. There's a whole protocol that I go through. And essentially it boils down to me just feeling what comes down on the paper, you know, and, and there's steps that I go through to kind of explore that. Um, and again, I'm trying to quiet out the mind. So I might, you know, I'm start with colors, right? I see blue, white, red, right? Um, and even already there, I might think to myself, hey, are we talking about, maybe this is a flag, maybe an yeah. American flag, right? I have to shut that guy up. Um, and there's ways to, there's little tricks and techniques to do that, but it's very hard. It's hard to stop that because um, our minds wander, right? But you put that aside and you just kind of keep going with the flow of information that comes down to the paper from your hand, right? Something will come. If you write something, it will happen right? Hmm. Where is that coming from? What is that? Right. And that's, that's this, this flow of information. Um, now is it, pardon me for interrupting, but is it, is it drawing a picture or is it actually words? Yep. It's a bit of both. So you'll start by kind of writing descriptors um, and it helps to have kind of a, an ordering, you know, you could do colors, dimensions, sounds, tastes, uh, movements, um, things like that. And then you do like a very basic sketch again, kind of taking what you've described, but also kind of freehand impulsive and in, in, intuitive what happens with your hand as you make something on the paper. <laughs> um, I know this all sounds wild. Um, and then depending on how uh, in depth you've been trained, there's other steps you can go to go even further. So the first sketch you do might have some kind of significant points on it or, or, or figures, right. That are kind of vague. And then you can do a session on each of those and get even more information. Um, you know, maybe you have like this kind of circular blob thing here and then like a triangular angle thing on the top, on top of it or something. So, okay, maybe there's two kind of distinguishing features here. Let's 
dive into the first one and then do another session for the second. And then maybe the first one you realize, oh, it's some kind of life form, um, you know, with, you know, bad smell and it's, it's, you know, got like soft, I don't know. It, it sounds like so many... to me. Yeah. But... Yeah, sure. Um, and then by the end of it, you know, you have all this, these descriptors, all these sketches and, and some of it is noise, you know, but you can always kind of see like there's a stream of um, something that, that kind of uh, a theme, you know, that kind of pops out and, and you can kind of take that and write up a, basically a summary at the end that kind of says not exactly what it is like, Hey, this is a car, you know, uh, like a BMW, you know, M3, whatever. No, it's not like that. It's, you almost have to describe it vaguely, but with, you know, you could say like it's a life form, you know, in some kind of water environment, you know, that uh, has some coarse skin and, you know, maybe it's a shark, you know what I mean? Um, but you don't say it's a shark. Um, so you try to keep, because the thing is, I, I've done so many sessions where I wasn't able to quiet that mind, that analytical mind. And I said, oh, this for sure is a shark. Like, everything is pointing to it being a shark, right? And then I get, I see the result just to, this is an example test just to see if I can practice the skill. And, you know, instead of it being a shark, it was maybe, oh, I don't know, um, you know, like a, a stencil, right? In the shape of, uh, you know, like a, an oval, like an eye shaped something. I don't know. So it kind of looked like a fish if, if, if I thought so, and, but may, you know, it actually wasn't. So maybe that's a really bad example, but it's, it's easy to get stuck on something that you think it is. And so you can try to pull back and just be more broad uh, and vague about it. Um, and and, and it, it usually will match better uh, to what it actually is. I know that sounds like you're maybe kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like trying to make it fit to something that it isn't. And that's why maybe this works, but um it's, it's not quite uh, that. It's, I'm explaining it wrong. but um, It almost yeah. sounds like you, you want your mind to be free-floating as much as possible. And yeah, I know exactly. that you know, the average person thinks something like 40,000 thoughts a day. So how on earth can you quiet your mind when you're trying to do this? Is, is there some type of meditation or something? Or? It's, it's hard. Um, you know, I think... I meditate in my own way. A lot of the memory training that I do actually um, before I memorize something where I have a fixed time to do it in and I'm trying to go really fast, you know, I have to be, I have to quiet the mind because I'm focusing on a task and it's rapid thoughts, right. Of, of what I'm, what I'm reading and trying to memorize and any other thought that comes in is going to detract from the, the thing that I'm doing and take away some points or the time that I have to memorize so through practice, I've just gotten better at that. Um, I don't meditate per se, but um, definitely before I memorize, I have kind of my own ritual to like lower my heart rate, to mm -hmm. control my breathing, to focus. Um, and it's kind of like that before I do one of these sessions. Um, sometimes I just try to write stuff to get it off my mind. You know, I have thoughts and feelings through the day. And I just need to barf it out so it's it's a blank slate breathe try to clear my mind and then I, I try to do the session it's not always perfect you know but um i think it's something that you can constantly try to work on and improve and what are the uh digits what what role do they play and you said i think you said eight digits or something like that or whatever it is random digits yeah i don't know what the who or why that was decided um but there's no information in it. Um, I think, do you need it? I never got a straight answer from people I asked about this. Like, what if, why do you need it, right? Why can't you yeah. just sit down? If you're we're truly coming up with anything, why can't you just sit down and do it? Um, but I think the way this all works has to do with intention on behalf of um, everybody involved. So somebody is setting this task up and saying, hey, this picture of a dog that I want Nelson to predict or, you know, psychically see, um, I'm going to associate it to something that I will give him. And through that thing I will give him, 
and through all this elaborate effort to create the situation, um, that is how he's going to connect to it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't fucking know. <laughs> um, but that's, that's my impression, right? So it gives you, the number gives you a place to kind of join into that, uh, that vibration line or that information line, maybe. Now, maybe uh, I want to ask a couple, a couple of things of what some of the things that you've done and been successful on, but um, it seems to me that I'd heard something so many years ago about um, there was, and I don't know who it was, but they somehow knew where uh, an enemy sub was. And I know that's probably what back in the 1970s, you know, the cold war era, what they were trying to uh, find different ways of, getting information, like you said, you know, we do have the satellites now, we have so much more, you know, so many more ways to get information. But uh, do you recall what I'm saying? There, there was some remote viewer that, if you can't recall that, I'm gonna ask you in particular, what's the most extraordinary account that you've uh, heard about or looked into? Yeah, um, yeah, so there's a few, I mean, some a lot of these are, are declassified now, and you can find the good history of, of a lot of the successful um, operations using remote viewing over the years um, in the 80s, 90s. One was um, there was a down down plane in, in the Sahara or, or somewhere in, in Sudan. I, I don't remember the details, um, and they were able to view it with uh, you know they couldn't find it, but uh, with remote viewing they were able to target it. Um, I forget who, I think that was McMonagall. Um, might've been Ingo Swan. I, I, I don't remember. Um, but that one's pretty famous. Um, you know, Joe McMonagall's found missing people um, using this ability. Mm -hmm. And he did this on live, on live TV. Um, the one that blew my mind, um, and this I heard about from Joe uh, McMonagall, um, and it's out there, man, but it's, it's crazy. So he, um, and I, I would assume for the show, you would love this, but he was given a target um, when he was part of the operations there. Um, and what he viewed was um, something that seemed off planet, um, very dry and desert-like, very red. Uh, it seemed to be Mars, okay? Um, except there was this massive pyramid, huge. Well, actually a few pyramids, right? Um, and there were beings there. Um, and he goes on to describe kind of what even the beings were feeling. And, and I think they were trying to get off the planet or, um, you know, something was running out on their planet and they were trying to, to leave or something like that. But they had been there for a while and they had these, these, these pyramids there. Uh, yeah, it turns out that the, the task was these coordinates on Mars and the actual target that they were looking for was Mars one million years ago, okay? Huh. Um, yeah, he didn't know this. Again, he's coming up with this out of nothing, right? Um, now, what's interesting is the, the coordinates. So the, the, the way they did tasks back there is they would give them a number, that represented coordinates on Earth, or in this case, Mars. Um, but they also, at, when they create the task, give it the, the detail that this is a million years ago, okay? Um, but the coordinates that they were trying to get him to extrapolate information from, extract information from, um, was a satellite image of Mars, of a crater, that next to it has this shape that seems to look like um, a uh, pyramid. Hmm. And if you look at the picture, I mean, it's from above and it's, it's grainy. It's, it's black and white. If you remember this is in the early two thousands, there was that famous face, Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those images where yeah. you look at this and you're like, is that a pyramid? looks like a pyramid. And even the shadow makes it look like if this was a pyramid, it would be huge. Right. Cause the, mm -hmm. the shadow is really long. Um, so anyways, that was the coordinate a million years ago on Mars. And uh <laughs> Yeah, and Joe has a ton of success uh, with his 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 thing. So, you know, you now take take that as it as you will. You know, 
I didn't realize that a time was part of it. Uh, yeah. Just because yeah. I haven't looked into it enough. But so uh, what about, has anyone tried to do future things? Yeah. And so this is where, you know, you, uh, nobody knows anything really about this in terms of how it works and what's possible. I've heard so many different things about, um, it seems like maybe in the past it's easier, um, let's say, because the information is there. Uh, just it's already happened, but I don't know if, if we're talking, if, if, if time and everything, it's all there, then how should it be any different for the future? I don't know, but I have tried to predict things in the future, right? The, 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 the initial thing I was a part of was predicting stocks. Um, oh, yeah. I've done a lot with trying to predict sport outcome, uh, sport events. And, um, it seems like, and then this is where I, you know, if, I don't know what's the right thing or not. I, it seems like the closer to the event you do this, the better the results. So now is that a total unbiased the same way, like trying to get your mind floating and not like, uh, you know, uh, like going a certain way because of some type of influence, like finding out something about someone being injured in a, you know, a sport or something like exactly, that. Exactly. Right. If I know the two teams and I know the favorite or like, I know, Oh, that's a better team or, you know, right. Like the Lakers are playing, but LeBron's injured or something I'm like, Oh, they're probably maybe not going to win this game. Right. So I, I don't want to know that information um, at all. Um, it's interesting when you have um, situations where it's an A or B outcome, you know, this team wins or that team wins. They, there's a specific kind of remote viewing called associative remote viewing. And the task is around um, predicting basically a photo. So somebody sets up a task where the two photos, A and B, very distinct photos from each other. One is associated to one outcome and one is associated to the other. And when I say associated, it's really just the, the, the person who sets the task is saying, hey, photo A, just even if they say this mentally, A is going to be associated with this person or team winning and be with that one. Okay. And then my task is to just, you know, describe something that I'm seeing. And if it, there's a, there's a judge involved um, and they judge which photo was the better match. And usually if you do this well, um, it's pretty clear, which is the winner. And that's your prediction. Okay. Hmm. Um, so that's the associative remote viewing. Um, and I'll usually do this, let's say before a match, tonight i might do it an hour before um i've also tried doing it well in advance so for example last year was the world cup um you know it's a 30-day tournament and a few of us in a remote viewing group were like let's try to predict the winner of the whole tournament right now there's what there's like 100 plus games to be played there were some favorites at the beginning but anything can happen in 30 days right so a lot of us in the group actually predicted Portugal, which wasn't a bad pick. Um, it, it was in, very interesting that a lot of us got Portugal. So there was something happening there. Now, Portugal got pretty far. I think they got to the, the final eight and then Morocco beat them. Um, but, the, you know, I remember, I think it was on the round of 16, um, Ronaldo didn't start. Right. It was a coach's decision. He's Ronaldo's the superstar, right? Um, he's a bit older, so maybe the coach, for whatever reason, decided he wouldn't start. He'd be subbing in. And that I feel like that's something that might affect his performance, his ego, right? Which might affect other players, right? My point is, is that over the course of 30 days, there's so many little things that can happen that mm. might divert the, the chances of something happening, right? So I, I see more of the future being a collection of probabilities, right? And there's some that are more likely to happen, some outcomes in the future than others. And so if you try to predict that, maybe you get the most likely outcome, but it's not necessarily the one that will happen, right? And as time gets closer to that point, a lot of those, the probabilities converge, converge to, to, to one, right? Or the, the probability function collapses, right? Um, that's my take on it. So Portugal did not win, they got pretty far. Um, but you know, you can't help but think like 30 days out, so much can happen. So mm. I think when you're trying to predict something, um, 
it's better to do it closest to the to the moment. Which you might think like, well, okay, so you can't really predict the future. Well, maybe I can, right? Uh, and it's worth something. If I can tell you who's going to win a game five minutes before it happens, I mean, you can make money, you know? Um, <laughs> Speaking over of time, that, that would, yeah. you know, that's not really letting go of the outcome <laughs> if money's involved, right? You know? Right, I mean, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, other people might argue that it doesn't work so well when your intentions are, not pure, right? So you're trying to make money or whatever. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, I do question, you know, like where are all the billionaire remote viewers, right? <laughs> I'm not one of them. <laughs> not yet. Uh, yeah. Not yet. Or maybe, yeah. Yeah, right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the true billionaires are, are just lying low. They did their, their, their sessions, uh, their remote viewing sessions, and they're just living it off in some beach uh, town somewhere. Yeah. Yep. So yes. now this is all really fascinating. And uh, can you, wh what about when you were being tested? Um, I, I understand it's, it's actually the, the accuracy of remote viewing isn't really that high, but, but there is, seems to be something to it. Um, so right. uh, did you have some that you can, that you actually were involved in that you were pretty amazed on how they came out, like how close it was? Yeah. Some examples. Yeah. 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 I could, uh, I could even pull some up. If I, am I allowed to share the screen? Uh, I do believe that you should, well, I, you can try. Do you see a present down below there? I do. Yeah. But I got to find you the can picture. Try it. it won't take too long, but I'll, I'll try to keep talking while. But, I'm or you could just it. email it to me and I could, I could pull it up if there's, if it's a link or if it's a. It's a photo. Um, it's a photo. So yeah. You can, you can just. My, my better sessions. Actually, it's the one I use for example all the time because it was so, it's the one that I saw and uh, it basically made me change my mind on the whole damn thing. Um, but before I show that one, I also talk about, um, well, first what you said that the success rate isn't that great. And that's, that's correct. It's, um, it's a pretty weak effect, okay, I'm not gonna lie. But it still is an effect, um, and I think is worth kind of turning your head towards because if there was nothing at all, yeah, we just go on with our lives, but if there's something, anything going on, I think that's worth kind of looking into, right? Um, mm. With the associative remote viewing where you basically are dealing with two options, um, you know, if you were truly guessing, it would be 50-50, right? Over time, thousands of trials with different people and groups should all balance out to 50-50, right? Or 50% correct, 50% wrong. Guessing photo A, photo B. If you're a good remote viewer, some people can get up to 70% correct. Mm. Um, again, not perfect, but, you know. Well, that's that's definitely that's impressive. Being right, most of the time, right? Or, or more than you're not. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, for me, I was flirting with like the high fifties, 60%, which is not that great, but it's definitely better than chance. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that. Um, now what I've been doing a lot recently, I live near the racetrack here in upstate New York is, uh -huh. um, yeah, <laughs> is, is going to the track. Right. Uh, and, and trying to guess the horse race winner. And um, I went one day last year, just one day, I was going to remote view every single match, uh, every single race, sorry. There were 10 races that day. Each race had about 10 horses. Some get scratched, some have more, some have less, but average is about 10. And uh, my goal was just to guess the winner, right, um, of those 10 races. Um, and I would do it right before each race. That day, I got four out of 10. Okay, so I was able to guess 40% of the time. Um, now, that may not sound that great. It's a small sample size, but it, um, you know, I would have expected to get one out of 10. Yeah, right? I mean, that, that's a lot, actually, when you think of it. And, and what generally happens, like if you were betting with money, then you had a really good day. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, mm. So... Uh, is this, I'm close to finding the thing I'm looking for, but anyway, so I kept doing that. So I, I kept doing it remotely from my house. Um, I would just, 
you know, find a, a, a match and then, um, or a race, and then I would bet on it and see what would happen. Um, and over time, so I've, I've been doing this for over a year now. Um, my results are still around 40%, a little less now, maybe I'd say 33%. Um, and I've done maybe like 60 trials now. Um, and so I was trying, I'm not, I'm not a statistician, but um, I can write, I'm a computer scientist, so I can write programs. I've done a lot of simulations. Like if this were chance, um, what, how likely is what I'm, what I'm doing right now uh, due to chance? And it was like one in more than 10,000. So to mm. me, that's significant, you know? Oh yeah, that, that's very um, good. It's a little really impressive chance. Yeah. All right, so I have here, this is, so you can see what one of my sessions look like. Um, now you may not be able to share it. You can try. Oh, okay. Um, if it's a photo, I don't think you're going to. So, but what I'd like to ask you to do is if you could just, uh, you can actually just drop it in an email and just send it to me and I'll pull it right up. You want to do that? Okay. Yeah. And so if you can talk, if you can multitask here. Um, yeah, I can keep talking. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting it into your inbox here. All right. Uh, so do you think that, uh, you know, you're talking about, say, people betting on horses. Do you think there are actually people that are actually doing this out there that, I mean, or are people, do people a lot of times, you know, there people a lot of times can have a problem with gambling, you know, it can really go in that yeah, direction. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I, I, I know, um, uh, um, that, uh, just from a friend of mine who actually, uh, he, he won really big in the islands, uh, when he had no money and he just happened to whatever it was, he was able to stay there for the rest of the, the winter. But ever since he had that, he's always thinking he's right on the edge of winning. Yeah, right. Uh, and it's been a problem, you know, for him. And so um, I'm just wondering, do people that you know, have you ever heard of someone trying to get this type of edge just in a, that's a gambler? In particular, uh, yeah, I mean, I've ho heard mostly of of groups of people doing this. I think that's where they have the best success because me doing it solo, I've just told you, I, I feel like I'm doing okay. I'm not betting crazy money because I, I I'm not a gambler. I just want to test something here, um, mm -hmm. so I'm like putting ten bucks a race kind of thing, you know. Um, but I haven't heard of anybody, you know, struggling with gambling addiction uh, <laughs> because of this. But yeah, I, it maybe is not the best way to to go about testing this. Um, you know, for me, the proof is in numbers, right? So the statistics, even the dollars, right? Uh, so if I started with an X amount of money and, and I do this for a year, what is the money that I have out? That to me is also an added um, proof to me. You know, I'm not really trying to prove it to the world. I just want more conviction uh from myself all the time so yeah i would mm -hmm. be careful with that maybe do it without money right or just try to um have tasks set up for you it's very easy to ask somebody to just randomly choose a photo associate associate a six to eight digit number and then give you that number right and then just practice with that uh, it's really cool just to even feel that you remotely get close to something that you have no information on um you won't get it every time sometimes you may get bits of it um but sometimes you will get something that will absolutely blow your friggin' mind well here's uh here's what you sent me there was also a whale did the whale have something to do with yeah let's look at the whale first uh oh let me uh let me uh upload that i didn't do that yet That's but okay. uh, uh i'll get that out right now yeah so what i'm showing you so when i was training um you know every day I learned more about the process, um, but my coach, Brett, would have me, he would come up with photos at random, and then I would do a session and try to perceive it, right? So this was one of them. That's the eight-digit number that I was given, 52601408, and um, this was the image, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what this image is. I don't know anything about the kinds of images that Brett is choosing. It's completely random. Um, Are they like in a sealed envelope or just in another location or... 
Usually, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In our case, since this was on COVID, uh, during COVID, we were doing our sessions remotely. So he just had them, I don't know, on his computer or, you know, I don't think he actually had an envelope, but I could not see them. Right. And, and for the, uh, for the audio listener here, it's a, uh, it's a, looks like a humpback whale um, arching out of the water and the numbers, the digits are 5260 slash 1408. Okay. And um, I can put these and I can do like show notes, a show note for you for this um, and can put that uh, in the show notes. So yeah. here's the, uh, here's the other image. Now, so there are maybe 10 pages of, of, of my whole session. This is the last page because like I said before, it's kind of where I take everything and I put it together in one sketch and then kind of do a best summary here. I apologize for my handwriting, but um, now if you're looking at this and you're like, dude, Nelson, that's not a friggin' whale. Okay. <laughs> I agree. Right. Like it's not, it's not a friggin' realistic painting. Right. Um, <laughs> but if you look at, let's look at the photo here. Right. So what I have is this thing coming out, right. Arched, mm -hmm. right. With these appendages, I drew these little things coming out. Granted, they only have two fins, but I did see some kind of appendages coming out of the side of this um, life form. If you write that I have animal there, I have furry, that's not correct. But again, listen, if you look at the photo, there's kind of like a, a fuzziness of water carried with the, the thing emerging out of the water. So I say furry here, perhaps that's what I, my analytical mind did a little bit of work there. and was like, you know what, maybe that's fur, right? It's not so clear, but in fact, it was like a layer of splashy water, right? Um, what else? So then there's also this line across the bottom here with the undulating waves. That's the water, right? That's the, hmm. the wavy water. And then off to the right, there's kind of like this thing with arrows going down. That was something I saw some kind of water wet thing dripping down. And you could argue that that's the, the water falling from the, the, the whale. Okay. Now, if you go, go back to the text again, well, I got, I got, I, I don't know if you can see this up on the screen right now, but I have them both up there at the same time, yep. side by side. Yep. You're not so, able to see that. So you can see uh, the arching is very similar. Uh, right. Yeah. That's now, really it's, it's, it's not perfect, right? So I think even here um, I'm talking about like when I'm describing the, the water portion of this photo, the, the ocean, I say land mass. That's not a land mass. Uh, expansive. Sure. Um, firm, no. Summer, no, right? Enjoyable, that's uh, subjective, right? Um, but there are so many other things that it's something, right? Um, and at the end here, I say, so we have some kind of native nature setting, true, in pleasant yeah. weather, that was not so true, with two distinct things on the site. One is a life form of sorts, breaching, with movement in and out. So I'm seeing something breaching out, um, uh, second thing, more wet, sticky, falling from up to down. I think that says amorphous. Um, yeah. And that's the, the water kind of falling down from this breaching animal, you know? Um, so, well, you know, I I get, that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. And, and listen, so I gave myself a 7.5 out of 10. He made me do that for every session. And yeah. I will tell you, as I rolled my eyes after every session, I was like, this is a one out of 10, maybe. This is a two if, if, if we're being very generous. But usually I would give it a zero or a one. I was very hard on myself. So when I saw this, um, I mean, the goosebumps came and I was just like, okay, that is not a one. That is not a two. That is not a three. That is not a four or five. This is something. And in that moment, I, I knew something was happening. You know, and, and listen, even if, Say I've done 100 sessions by then, which I had, and I've done maybe 20, 25. Maybe you could argue that out of 100 sessions, one of them would be some kind of whale coming out of the water, right? And it just was luck, right? Um, but uh, I definitely felt something when I did that session, and it felt like I knew what it was. And I, I, I don't think this is chance either, so. Yeah, well, that's... That's pretty spectacular. I'm going to uh, share your um, your website right here. Oh, great! And 
because I can do that on this end. And so here, here's your website. And But I would imagine you probably don't have remote viewing on this. <laughs> is that... Is that no right? mention of that. Not yet. Um, Not yet. <laughs> my YouTube channel is mostly memory tech. Oh, well, it's basically memory techniques. But um, I was part of a project with another YouTuber who posted all this remote viewing stuff. Um, I should maybe share that with you. It'd be very interesting for your viewers. Um, and I have my own videos that I've been secretly working on that I'll eventually release to kind of test the waters. But um, I'm taking my time with that. That'll eventually come out. And uh, I do want to you know, we don't have a lot of time here left, but I, I do think it's quite amazing that you have tried to climb and you got really close to the summit of uh, Mount Everest, which uh, must have felt like it took years off your life from what I've heard other people talk about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of the lines on my face are from that. <laughs> and sure. uh, um, Dave Scott told me that you got really close one time and you knew that you had to turn around or you were going to die. Yeah. What well, I mean, uh, I know we're we're off topic. Of what we were talking about, but uh, I, if you don't mind, what was that experience like? Yeah, um, this was uh, 2011. It was the first attempt on Everest, and um, I was young, but uh, strong and committed and, and ready to summit this thing. And I think I would have. Um, one of the issues I had when I got partway up to the summit was my oxygen mask malfunction um oh. so i ended up having to climb without it um which you can do if you're like an insane athlete um and you acclimatize properly that way i had not because i i was intending to use oxygen after a certain point which most climbers do um so climbing without it uh really messed me up and by the time i got to what's called the south summit which is just 60 70 meters from the top um, I was in a very precarious situation. I sat down. Um, it was one of those things you hear about where you know, somebody sits down and they just don't move and they just That's right. become a part of the mountain. The end. That could have been me. Uh, and I felt like, yeah, I could go to sleep now. Um, and there I, are people that are part of the mountain. There are. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of dead and bodies up there. There's uh, one in particular that I've heard people say they went by the guy with was it a blue jacket or something. Well, there's uh, green boots. I don't know if that's the one. Green boots. About. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They actually yeah. removed him. Uh, I was an Indian climber from, I think, 96 um, yeah. on the north side. I've actually, I've, I've stepped by him on a, a different attempt. But um, yeah, I heard that they took him away. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was a surreal experience. The whole, that, I mean, each of my climbs have been a crazy story. But that one in particular, I, I was very close to... Uh, being one of those fixtures and what goes on, what went on in my mind that night was it's a whole other show. Um, mm -hmm. Very surreal, dreamlike things, hallucinations, voices. Was that, was um, some of that had to do with the uh, uh, lack, lack of oxygen because you're, do you think yeah, some of that? Had I, to I do think so. That? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Right. Um, uh, you're at almost 29,000 feet. Um, cool. you know, and yeah, the, the amount of oxygen, there's about a third as there is at sea level. Right. So our brain needs oxygen. Of course, you're not functioning at your, your sharpest. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of people report seeing hallucinations and, uh, a lot of weird things happening in your head. Were you there? Were you climbing alone or did you have someone with you? Yeah, with my team, you know, we were kind of in the line. Uh, we spread out through the night, though, as some climbers were faster, some were slower. Um, but I, each climber had their own uh, Sherpa um, climbing with them. Oh, really? Wow. To assist. They're such these powerful, uh, strong local um, climbers. And, you know, we, we hire them and pay them to basically do all, you know, we're just these amateurs walking. And they do all the hard work. Um, oh, like the carrying the gear. Yeah, the yeah. Gear. yeah. And setting the ropes and taking care of us. And wow, yeah. yeah. Wow. Something you think you'll ever try again, or you think you're pretty much done with it? No, I would love to. Um, I think I can do it. <laughs> you know, it's been a few times, but I feel like I can do it. And um, I'm thinking maybe either next year or the year after. Would you know? the mountains changing a lot? So we'll have to see, but. 
I'd like to, I love that place. You know, it's my, and, and what, in what way is the mountain changing? Just the way it's climbed and oh. how busy it is and who these days thinks they can climb Everest and who can't. And I don't know, there's a lot of like politics and, um, yeah, it's, it's not quite as natural as it used to be. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're, we've gone about an hour, but, uh, just one thing I want to, uh, again, bring up your website because, uh, you do actually give uh, an online memory course, which I, oh, and there's a wait list. Oh, it's closed is, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. But we open it up um, maybe two or three times a year. Um, probably the next one will be sometime in fall. Um, but yeah, I have my memory course. I also teach um, privately if anybody wants one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have some books on Amazon. If you search my name, that uh, teach memory techniques. And then I have my YouTube channel, which is absolutely free. So you have to watch some ads That's sometimes, great. but it's free. Yeah. Well, well, I'll put all this in the uh, show notes here. And uh, anyway, this is really great. I looked at some of the videos. I saw the one where you, uh, you were teaching your wife, the uh, Royal, uh, I, I, what was it? The Royal, yeah, the, 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 monarchy, the monarchy, right? The British. Yeah, the monarchy, um, yeah. the that was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, she did well. She did really well. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the techniques work. I didn't, yeah. you know, I didn't have to do much. <laughs> uh, I, I, before we started, I told you I had taken a memory course and, uh, years ago in the 1990s and it was all cassette tapes, but, uh, the, the way that I was learning then, and I can't think of the person that, um, I can almost hear he had a very strong accent, uh, like a, a New York accent or something. But, oh um, yeah, Harry Lorraine. Harry Lorraine. That sounds right. That's it. No I knew it was guy. Harry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Harry. Yep. So very distinct uh, accent. <laughs> but he was teaching to use consonant sounds, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I learned all that. Like, uh, say, uh, to I can't remember exactly how to associate, but it was all pictures in your mind and extraordinary yeah. pictures if you could do them. The more extraordinary the more uh, easier it is to rem remember. Uh, when you're trying to remember a person's name, look at something about their face and try to make their name work with their face and some outstanding feature and picture that feature really exaggerated. Everything has to be exaggerated. Yeah. Is any part of, uh, uh, of what you do similar to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these techniques haven't, I didn't come up with them. You know, I mean, I've come up with my own kind of take on them and, and some strategies that maybe are my own. But yeah, I mean, these techniques have been around for thousands of years. And Harry Lorraine was a, another era teaching the same thing just in his voice. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of what I teach as well. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you why why I cho chose to, to, to do that. He was in some television program where there's a big audience. Yeah. And uh, he was given a... <clears throat> I believe it was at Time Magazine, mm -hmm. and he had like 15 minutes ahead of the show, whatever, to memorize the Time Magazine. Yeah. So someone randomly in the audi audience said, uh, page 73, I'm just throwing a number out there, and he said, it's an American Express card ad, and the number on the card is 574-379, like that, and it's uh, John Doe, and, you know, I mean, just to me, it just blew me away. And so I just said, okay, I'm going to try to try to figure this out. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, of course, I forgot everything. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. But, uh, but a simple grocery list is you picture one thing like jumping into another or, you know, an exaggerated, like a banana jumping into a box of cereal or you no, know, you have to get bananas and cereal or whatever it is. Uh, it's all about visualizing these crazy pictures and visualization the and the exaggeration and, things over the top and, and interaction, all that kind of stuff is, is what makes something pop in your memory. But when you're memorizing several decks of cards in a row, yeah. I just can't even imagine it's, I mean, I mean, how yeah. do you, can I ask you how you, of course, how you yeah. Do that? yeah. So in that case, you know, you have a bunch of cards that are just symbols, right? There's a number and a suit. Um, so if you could exaggerate, right you know, a 10 of diamonds and imagine it doing, you know, you, that would be great. But the problem is, is 
how can you really imagine a number and a diamond, you know, especially when they're all a sequence of them and they all look the same, right? Essentially there's so many, there's four different tens, right? And it's just four suits. So what we do in that case is we strategized and came up with an idea to what if we gave each card its own image, right? Through some means, some convention where we can convert the number in the suit into, let's say a word, kind of like your, your consonants you were talking about for numbers. Um, so essentially with a pack of cards, all 52 cards for me and other memory athletes are uh, a picture of something instead of the actual suit and number. Um, so for example, 10 of diamonds to me is Oscar de la Hoya, the boxer. Okay. So whenever I see this card, I don't see this. I see him in a boxing ring sweating with his gloves on, you know, Isn't that's something. And so that's easier to remember. So if the first card is the 10 of diamonds, all I'm doing is picturing Oscar de la Hoya, right? And then the next card comes along. Uh, Jack of Hearts is a pirate. So maybe he's in the boxing ring beating the crap out of, of a pirate, right? I can picture the pirate hat coming off. He's like saying, Arg, right? He's got a hook for a hand or something. <laughs> and that I can exaggerate, right? And then when I go back to remember, I say, oh, okay, I was at the boxing match, Oscar de la Hoya, 10 of diamonds, right? Punching the crap out of a pirate, Jack of Hearts, right? If I know that conversion, it's that part's easy, right? It's just a matter of weaving this elaborate story that represents the cards or this abstract information. Well, I didn't realize you had cards on you there. Any chance oh. we can, can any chance we can get a demonstration in some we way? Could. Yeah, it's 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 a bit of dead air time. Uh, it takes me about like a minute or two to 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 do it. Um, you can just watch my videos. I don't know. Okay, so this. he's shuffling the cards. And uh, so while you're doing that, I'm going to go through your website. Um, and I'm going to bring this up here. And let's see if I can. I'm not sure if I can actually play a video of yours. But, uh, but gonna, I'll go through your website while you, you go ahead can and I, concentrate. Can I mute you so I don't get distracted? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm just going to take out my... Yeah, you go right ahead. Yeah, you go right ahead. Yeah. So uh, we're going to let him do that. This is kind of exciting. I think this is fun. I hope... Uh, um, let's see. I'm going to look in the chat while we're doing this too. Um, if there's anything... Uh, thank you all for being here tonight in the chat. Uh, we have Stephen who kept asking about the color of his shirt, if he could guess that. Uh, cable guy, uh, his highness, um, and then someone from Facebook, Lee B. Thank you for showing up here. Yoshi Yoshi. Um, let's see. Let me look at some other. And I do want to thank everyone for coming to the special last kind of last minute show that we had here for sure. I've seen you on many times. His highness and Furco. Thank you all for being here. Random Rick reviews, RRR. Uh, <laughs> Ferco was said earlier that uh, he kept asking, okay, what did I have for dinner tonight? What did I have for dinner? And then finally he said uh, he had a check Chick-fil-A. And then people down below said, yeah, I knew it. Uh, anyway, I thought that was kind of kind of funny. Uh, so anyway, I hope you learned something. You know, I did. I learned a lot uh, tonight what remote viewing is not and uh, and what it is. It's, it's really fascinating. And I didn't realize, you know, so much of it just had to do with just trying to, uh, you know, keep a, a neutral, neutral thought pattern. And what I didn't realize also is that the person has no clue to what they are going to be. Um, trying to, they absolutely have no clue as to what it is that they're going to be doing. I didn't realize that. So I think that makes it kind of special um, for it to have some type of accuracy. And uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get to some of your questions here, but uh, we're going to be uh, probably getting close. Are you done? All right. So, um... Let me just, I've, I've memorized it. Let me just uh, go through it in my head to make sure I have it before I say it. Okay. Um, once I do that, if I have it, then it's, it's usually there for a while. So hold on one second.
Okay. All right. I think I have it. So I want to, what's the best way to do this? I'll show it. I have to close my eyes. So you, I'm seeing if I have a blindfold. But okay. I so uh, let me put you up so you're solo here on the screen. Okay. Can you see this? I can see it. All right. Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready, but you're going to have to hold it up a little bit higher. Okay. Is that good? A little bit higher. Right there is perfect. Okay, everyone. Here he goes. Can you see that my eyes are closed? I don't want you I to I can think see your eyes are closed. Okay. All right. So queen of clubs. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, six of spades. Yep. Uh, four of spades. Yep. Um, uh, three of clubs. Yep. Uh, jack of spades. Yes. Uh, nine of spades. Yep. Um, seven of clubs. Yeah. You keep going and I'll, I'll say, I'll say if you get it wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. If I don't hear anything, I've got it right. So, yep. so, so that was seven of clubs, um, uh, ace of diamonds, uh, eight of hearts, um, nine of clubs, queen of spades, uh, five of hearts, eight of spades, uh, three of spades, ace of spades, um, jack of hearts, uh, 10 of clubs, uh, two of clubs, uh, nine, sorry, I don't know if I, is this nine of diamonds? Next one. Next one's nine of diamonds. Okay. So nine, nine of diamonds, uh, queen of diamonds, ace of hearts, seven of hearts, uh, jack of clubs, king of spades, nine of hearts, uh, six of diamonds, 10 of diamonds, king of clubs, um, ace of clubs, uh, eight of diamonds. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Four of hearts, seven of diamonds, six of hearts, uh, two of hearts, five of spades, four of diamonds, um, seven of spades, 10 of hearts, two of spades, five of diamonds, queen of hearts, uh, 10 of spades, five of clubs, king of diamonds, eight of clubs, king of hearts, three of diamonds, four of clubs, jack of diamonds, six of clubs, two of diamonds. Oh, I have two more? Oh, no, this is the two of diamonds, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then this is the um, uh, three of hearts. Yeah. Yay. Nice. Unbelievable. There you go. Wow. <laughs> 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 now that was just amazing so thank you so much for doing that sure. extra little little bit um so are you tired now when you do something like that does it it, it seems to me like that would be really a strain on the brain it's okay once i'm into it it's fine i just get nervous uh put on the spot I, i'm out a little out of practice to be honest just um you know my best ever it takes me like 30 seconds um but when I'm doing it live and I want to get it perfect and, you know, it's... I'm yeah, I really put you on the spot. A minute or just, two just, minutes, yeah. Yeah, just to let everyone know. I, I You had no idea that I was going to do it. I mean, we were going to no, talk about... No, I didn't even think that you were going to ask me so. about this stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I really appreciate it. It's, I, can uh, I... I don't know if... Can I ask one thing? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is a UFO. Well, it's not the UFO podcast, but can we... Can I ask oh, no, no. Here? I'm all about UFOs. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I've had two encounters. All right. They're not the greatest ones, um, yeah. but I think there's something. Okay. Um, one was I was just outside late at night doing a workout in my driveway. There's this orange light, you know, and I'm very cognizant of the stars and where they are and what's out. But this one seemed a little brighter than usual, a little bigger than usual. Didn't recognize it as what it should be in the sky. Um, and I was doing these this intense workout, jumping over this bar, blah, 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 back and forth. And then maybe five, 10 minutes later, um, I saw it a little bit closer, bigger, it seemed. And then five minutes later, when my workout was finished, it was gone, right? Um, and I had this whole weird feeling that it was kind of like watching me. Um, but that was one. It, it could yeah, be. Wait a minute. Let, me, let me just, would you consider that an orb? Yeah, it was definitely an orb shape. Yeah, yeah, because there is there is a there's a guy that has written book a book on orange orb UFO sightings. So it's not 
it's not uh what is his name um i can't think of it right now but uh yes uh that that is something that a lot of people talk about different color orbs but orange seems to be a predominant uh color of a lot of these whatever cool. they are okay yeah yeah okay let's hear the second one the other one uh happened recently i was on a mountain um and the stars out there are insane okay mm. so i was on kilimanjaro and um, oh wow you can just see the milky way i bet know, for miles yeah and um you know i actually was trying to what is it c5 i was trying to oh yeah have you heard about that yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, like why not, right? And especially if I'm into this remote viewing stuff, why can't I sit here and try to conjure something up in the sky? So I sat there um, and really focused my energy on, you know, a specific part of the sky. Nothing really happened except at the end, when I was like, I was like, okay, it didn't work. Um, I saw, I think what's referred to as like a flash bulb where hmm. it's it was just like a star that went really bright and then disappeared right it was hmm. brighter bigger than a star and that was it um but it felt like a response to what i was doing um, huh. so i don't know yeah. what else does that out in, in in the stars yeah i've never had an experience like that so i can't uh, i've done a lot of star watching and it wasn't just like a twinkling it was like someone turned a flashlight on and then off you know, very consciously. Huh. So that was interesting. Maybe you saw a supernova. Maybe. <laughs> no, no, they would know all about that. You'd be, hearing, longer, you'd be hearing about that. But yeah. anyway, excellent. Well, it's been it's been a blast. Thank you. You're a very interesting person. And uh, Thanks, it was really a pleasure to have you on this show and to talk about such a variety. And yeah. uh, anyway, I will link all your uh, your memory course and the website and everything to the show notes for this show for and i i will send you the links to uh my friend's youtube channel where you can watch the there's like three episodes plus a podcast of the investigative stuff we did about remote viewing we interviewed joe mcmonagall we interviewed um oh MMA. yeah we yeah please do that um, right away and i'll put these in and just for the uh for the uh for youtube i can link the show notes the show notes will actually be part of the uh part of the show on another page so that's how someone will be able to find that. And okay, cool. uh, it'll be linked to it. But yeah. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Have a good one. All right. Take care. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching and listening. And we'll be back with something interesting on the show at another time. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.